Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. The governor and DFL leaders have agreed on how to divvy up the budget surplus, and tax relief is much less than the GOP's proposal. Senator Bill Weber outlines the Republican tax plan, and Senator Jordan Rasmussen offers a way to lower the cost of gasoline. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Governor Tim Walz, House Speaker Melissa Hortman, and Senate President Bobby Joe Champion announced their agreement on budget targets for the next state budget. Among the allocations for the $17.5 billion budget surplus, the governor and legislative leaders have directed that $3 billion be used for tax relief, $2.35 billion for early education, children, and families, $2.2 billion for E-12 education, approximately $1 billion for transportation, and $1 billion for housing. Smaller investments include an additional $670 million for the environment and natural resources, $650 million for public safety, $400 million for state government, and $128 million for veterans and military affairs. Additional budget items include $668 million to implement a statewide paid family and medical leave program, $240 million to tackle lead pipes, and $40 million in disaster relief. The agreement also includes almost $2.3 billion for an all-cash public infrastructure bill. From historic investments to, uh, in education to building towards the workforce in the future and leveraging federal dollars in a way to attract some of the most innovative businesses to the state of Minnesota, this budget has it. It also makes sure that we're able to deliver on a bonding bill so Minnesotans across this state know they're going to be able to get those projects that are so important to them. So the investments that will make life safer will make life cheaper and more affordable for folks that will invest us into what that workforce of the future looks like, all while balancing the budget and returning money back into the pockets of Minnesotans, both in the short term and in the long term. This puts the legislative session back in the hands of all 201 legislators. Too often you have seen in the past that the leaders take a really long time to give budget targets to the chairs and to the members of the legislature. At this point in time, we have targets that the chairs in the House and the Senate will get and the commissioners will get and they will now work together and when they are done with those bills, we will bring them to the floor, we will pass them and we will do what we have been doing. We will continue to put great bills on the governor's desk for him to sign to improve lives for the people of Minnesota. The things that I am most excited about in this budget is our historic investment in education from our littlest learners all the way through K-12 and through college. I think this is the largest increase in early education, K-12 and higher education that I can recall in my time serving in the legislature over the past nearly 20 years. Also significantly, we are doing what young voters asked us to do. We are funding significant climate action in this budget. We are also making investments for veterans and for people of color when we think in terms of all across this wonderful state. But we're also thinking about our future and how do we help address issues of national security by making sure that we have robust opportunities uh, when it comes to jobs and economic development and opportunity. We've been very thoughtful about every um, line item that's there and looking at it fiscally uh, from a fiscally responsible way and providing space for robust discussion to happen here at the uh, at the Capitol. A day later on the Senate floor, Senate Republican leader Mark Johnson offered his assessment of the DFL budget targets. You know, this bill is a glimpse of the impact of the problems that we see with the one party system with nearly 18 billion dollars in surplus. The Democrat Party here is growing government by 30%. This is massive growth in the size and scope of government and taxpayers will ultimately be footing this bill. Folks, this is scary. This is a runaway train of spending in Minnesota that Minnesota taxpayers will be paying for years and years to come. Folks, we have to remember who we're working for. We're working for Minnesotans. We're not working for Minnesota government and this budget is a reflection 
of Minnesota government growth. Governor Tim Walz and DFL legislative leaders released budget targets this week, utilizing the state's $17.5 billion budget surplus to supplement spending in more than 30 budget areas, including $3 billion earmarked for tax relief aids and credits. The DFL plan is in marked contrast to a tax relief proposal put forward by the Republicans. Joining me to talk more about it is the ranking member of the Senate Tax Committee, Senator Bill Weber. Thanks for joining me. You're most welcome. Glad to be here. Uh, the Republican tax plan would have used significantly more of the budget surplus for tax relief, $13 billion. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of the Republican plan, what's your view of the DFL budget targets and in particular the $3 billion that they have allocated for tax relief? Well, quite frankly, I believe it's woefully inadequate. Uh, when you're looking at a, a surplus of well, the official surplus is $17.5 billion. If we wouldn't have done their accounting shift to begin with, that would be $19 billion of surplus. Uh, that is money that the taxpayers of Minnesota have paid in over and above what was needed to run the state of Minnesota. They deserve some of it back, and they deserve much more than $3 billion. And so uh, I really am disappointed in, in that uh, target for tax relief for Minnesotans. If you look at, at what the agreement was a year ago with, uh, out, uh, any, without the extra surplus, a much smaller surplus, uh, you know, the governor had agreed to $4 billion of tax relief at that point. So it's even less than what they had agreed to with a smaller surplus. And that's, uh, that's just not adequate for the taxpayers of Minnesota. Republicans and some DFLers campaigned during last campaign season on the idea of completely eliminating tax on Social Security income in Minnesota. Why is it important that Minnesota completely stop taxing Social Security income? Well, for one thing, it's, it's creating an incentive for many of our senior citizens to change their state of domicile. Uh, you know, the, People complain about removing the income tax on, on all of Social Security benefits. Well, you're benefiting the rich. Well, guess what? It's the rich that are the, are the upper echelons of our income producing people uh, who, and retired as such that can afford to change their residence. If they have family here, yeah, fine. They'll be back here for five months and 29 days. And, and they will have a place somewhere else. They will change their residence. And quite frankly, we're going to lose a lot more tax revenue than the $1.3 billion per biennium that, that removing the income tax on Social Security benefits would cost the state of Minnesota. The GOP plan also recommends offering $5 billion of the surplus in rebate checks. First, how much does that mean for each taxpayer? We were looking at uh, $1,250 per single person and $2,500 per married couple, and, uh, which is, is, you know, is a good uh, bump of money coming back in uh, to them. You know, and some people have questioned, well, you know, you, you were pretty lukewarm to the governor's idea of a rebate last year. Well, I would also remind people that our surplus is much larger this year. So we have, uh, and last year we were emphasizing, let's have ongoing tax relief. You know, every week, every month, every paycheck, you know, that was what we wanted to do for the people of Minnesota. This year, quite frankly, we have enough of a surplus in order to do both. Now, you mentioned that Governor Walz has also proposed uh, rebate checks, and it's unclear whether the legislative DFL majority support that at this point. But new information lately from some economists, including Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank President Neil Kashkari, um, they're warning that rebate checks could drive inflation higher. Is that of concern to you? Well, so will the spending of $14 billion additional money over and above any tax benefits going back to the taxpayers. Um, the governor's proposal is going to raise state spending over $14 billion from our previous budget. And, uh, you know, that is what will generate inflation. Uh, just like the overspending at the federal level has generated inflation across the country. As we look at those folks that are in the lower income brackets, as we look at senior citizens, when you all of a sudden have $5 eggs, you have 30, 35% increase in their energy costs, uh, inflation has taken a real hard hit on them. 
Uh, when you look at our families that, you know, when they're trying to provide food uh, every day for their families, used to be, like I said, eggs were a cheap meal. Now at $5 a dozen, that's no longer a cheap meal for them. Uh, inflation has hit these people very hard. And quite frankly, it's re bringing this money back to them in terms of a rebate, uh, in terms of reduced tax uh, amounts, would really help them at the end of the day. Now you mentioned families because another part of this, this platform uh, is a proposal that would give $1,800 uh, tax credit per child under 18 for the next two years. So I assume helping to cover the cost of having children is part of that, but what, what is the rationale then for that 1800 Well, there again, uh, all of our costs have, have risen, but you know, uh, the cost to raise a child these, these days continues to go up. Uh, and we want to make sure whether, whether we're talking about child care, whether we're talking about feeding our children, whether we're talking about uh, providing clothing and getting them to all their events and the cost of the events, all these costs continue to go up. Uh, this credit would, you know, for this one time would help them weather the inflationary storm that we've experienced. And, you know, and I think the other thing that, that we need to talk about while we're talking about our children, we're talking, and let's talk about education for a little bit. I visited with my superintendents last week, and we hear great t discussion from the other side of the aisle about the extra money that they're going to put into education. Now let's talk about the additional costs to education. If my superintendents have been doing the math, something that many people in St. Paul have real difficulty in accomplishing. And as they started to add the costs of all these different mandates that they're placing on education, whether we're going to talk about paid family leave, whether we're going to talk about curriculum, whether we're going to talk about all the other requirements that they wish to place on education, in the education committee on our schools, they're looking and saying, telling me, they're looking at a 27 to a 35 percent increase in their cost to provide education. And, and, and what are the Democrats talking about? Five percent roughly extra per student uh, on the formula? Um, they said if you have a choice between no mandates and no increase in funding, go with the no mandates because quite frankly under their plan we're going to be in a losing proposition. And so we're going to have to do one of two things. We either have to pass that cost on to the real estate taxpayers, which we can't do uh, and, and survive, and or we have to start reducing and eliminating programs. So that's the choices that we're being given in, our, in the education of our children. Now, you mentioned real estate. You, one of your areas of expertise is property tax and another part of this platform is your proposal that would provide property tax relief through increases in the homestead market value exclusion. So first tell me what that means and then tell me what that means for Minnesotans. Okay. Uh, you have three types of, of homestead value exclusion. One is for residential property, one is for agricultural homestead property, and the other one is for resort homestead property. And we included all three in our in our proposal. And basically Years ago, people always knew what a homestead credit was. If you lived in a home, or you lived on your farm, or you were a operator, resident of a, of a resort, you got a credit against your real estate tax for the fact that it was your homestead. Well, as values went up, that credit kept going up, and it got to be to a point where it was too expensive for the state. So they went to a homestead value exclusion. That is, a portion of your value is excluded if it is your homestead. Now, what they did is they started to phase that out. Uh, you know, it was in place uh, up until 70 some thousand dollars, and then by the time you got to 400 and some thousand for a residential property, uh, you basically ran out of that, and so you didn't get any benefit from that exclusion anymore. What we propose is a 25% increase in that residential value exclusion, and therefore uh, that would take it up to 500 and some thousand, and they would continue to get benefit for those increased values. So another tax benefit part of your the Republican, not just yours, but the whole Republican proposal. Uh, Senator Bill Weber, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Governor Tim Walz held a ceremonial bill signing on a measure designed to curb the theft of catalytic converters. 
if there's things that we can do um, to both make it harder to do some of these things and then sending a very strong message of accountability. If you're a person either stealing these or buying these catalytic converters, there needs to be a, a harsh penalty for it. We need to disincentivize a crime that it was all too easy for folks to do and apparently before this piece of legislation, all too easy to move um, those catalytic converters that they took off. It's not going to end the crime. We know that. But it will make it a lot harder for people to sell. It'll make them a lot harder for people to evade. We've had law enforcement reports around the state where they'll stop a car with four or five cutoff converters in the back seat. And they have no probable cause to stop them. Now in Minnesota, it will be a crime after August 1st to possess a used catalytic converter that's not attached to a car unless it has the vehicle identification number written on it, which is easy for you to do. It's easy for a muffler shop repairing cars to do. It's easy for a scrap dealer to do. It's not easy for a thief to do because if they write it on there, they got your pin for theft. If you don't put it on there, you're breaking the law, the same level of theft. And then what we're creating is this new database, a database that will be able to enter in catalytic converters as they're purchased, and that will be available to all the Minnesota law enforcement so that they can see who's selling these, who's purchasing them, and to make sure that we have an eye on the trade of catalytic converters as they're legitimately moved for scrap in the state, but we're eliminating the environment and the, the sale of these particular uh, catalytic converters in the illicit market. Being a victim of theft of your catalytic converter does not know any socioeconomic boundaries. Victims are single parents. Senior citizens, students, teachers, and business owners, just to mention a few. Many of these individuals depend on their sole vehicle to get to work, take their kids to schools or to activities, and make medical appointments. It can take months to obtain a replacement Cali converter, and they are expensive. <laughs> An attempt to lower the cost of gasoline by repealing Minnesota's law that requires a minimum markup of eight cents per gallon is making progress in the legislature. Joining me is the Senate author of a bill to eliminate the mandatory price increase, Senator Jordan Rasmussen. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Uh, laws for minimum markups are meant to deter predatory pricing and a handful of states have them, including Minnesota. What was the rationale for requiring gasoline sales to be marked up in the first place, and why here eight cents? The pitch when these laws were originally proposed was that it was going to protect against predatory pricing in the marketplace, um, basically having gas retailers come in and price way below cost until they drive competition out of the market. What we've seen, though, in the about 40 states that don't have a minimum markup on gasoline is that that behavior just doesn't occur. The Federal Trade Commission on a bipartisan basis has opposed these types of laws, including the one that Minnesota has, because it ends up hurting consumers. It costs them more at the pump. And so I think the question that we have as legislators when it comes to the minimum markup on gas is, should our consumer protection laws be there to protect consumers, or are they there to protect the profit margins for our petroleum marketers? Now, this idea has gotten a lot of interest since you introduced it with Dan Wogelmott in the House uh, several weeks ago. How did it come to you? Where did you get this idea? Well, during the campaign, I think uh, a lot of us got strong feedback from voters in our community that the price of gas is something that they're really worried about. And there's not a whole lot that the state of Minnesota can do to impact the gas price, uh, but repealing this law is one of those things. And we've seen bipartisan support, uh, both here in the legislature and across other states. Uh, Scott Jensen campaigned on this idea as a part of his uh, platform to lower the price of gas. Governor Evers of Wisconsin, who's a Democrat, also campaigned on eliminating their minimum markup law. And then here, both in the House and the Senate, we have bipartisan support. It passed out of the House Commerce Committee. Um, we had a great hearing in the Senate Commerce Committee. And so excited about the bipartisan traction this bill's been getting. You said at the press conference uh, that the passage of this bill is an issue of economic justice. What do you mean? 
Well, one of the interesting things about this law is that it doesn't apply to some of the big retailers. And so if you have a membership at Costco or Sam's Club, if you can afford to shop at those places, you can oftentimes buy your gasoline 20 cents or cheaper per gallon. And so this is just making sure that we're putting all retailers on a level playing field and that all Minnesotans, regardless of where you buy your gas, that you can have access to, to cheaper gasoline. Now, why is it that those big box retailers don't have to abide by this law? Because they are club stores and they're membership based, they don't uh, publicly post their price. And so it's, uh, that's uh, why the law doesn't apply to them. Another interesting way that some of the larger retailers have gotten around the law is having uh, coupons or other loyalty programs that also uh, don't apply. And so um, that's actually, we had one small gas retailer over uh, on the western part of the state who wrote a letter to the committee saying that he wants this law repealed so that he can compete with some of the uh, bigger box stores in their community. So because of coupons or because of membership, there are ways that it's actually not a level playing field with the minimum markup in place. That's right. Yeah, Costco can uh, price cheaper than other retailers can. So Minnesota had this minimum markup law until 1984 when it was repealed. It was then reinstated in 2001, so we've had about 22 years with it again. Uh, according to the Star Tribune, the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater did a study during that period of time when we, as a state, did not have the minimum markup law. And that study found that the price consumers paid was actually two cents more per gallon. What are some of the reasons that you believe that this wouldn't happen again, that these savings would truly be passed on to the consumer? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm glad you brought up that study. It was actually paid for by the petroleum marketers in Wisconsin. And um, I think they also, in that same study, talk about how the vast majority of economists have come to different conclusions, including um, whether it's been Republican or Democratic administrations at the Federal Trade Commission have said that these laws simply drive up the price for consumers and end up costing them more at the pump. And if you think about just the intuition of it, you know, Every industry, every profession would love to have a minimum markup law on the goods and services they offer because it helps them uh, protect their profit margins and it helps guarantee them a profit on their product. And so uh, that's why uh, there's been a, a whole host of research that's been done on this topic. And again, 40 states don't have it. And the Federal Trade Commission and others have said that they see savings uh, when laws like this are repealed. Now, does this minimum markup apply to diesel as well? I'm one of the few people who actually drives a diesel vehicle, and I would love to see my gas price go down. It does not apply to diesel sales, um, which I think is another argument in our favor uh, from those who have said that you know, there will be issues if we repeal this law. We currently don't have it on diesel sales, and I haven't heard a single issue um, from those who are out selling diesel in the Minnesota market. Could the repeal of this start gas wars where businesses begin competing against one another to bring in business? And while that level of competition may be good for consumers, could that potentially put some smaller businesses out of business? There's actually been a lot of research done on this as well. And states that have minimum markup laws versus states that don't, there's no difference in the number of small businesses or gas stations in those states. And so we haven't seen that be a factor in the states that don't have minimum markup laws. Um, I think what you'll see is you'll see cheaper gas from Minnesotans. And I'll give an example. In the North Metro, there was a small family-owned gas station that had a competitor across the street report them to the state of Minnesota for selling their gas too cheaply, and they were just simply trying to attract customers, uh, get them into their store, you know, sell them other goods and services that they offered. And so really this is uh, the state of Minnesota going after businesses that are simply trying to give their neighbors and customers a good price on gas. I'm thinking about small businesses and just wondering if, if this necessitates that they have to change their business plan. I, you know, convenience stores have candy, chips, snacks, sodas. That's kind of where they make their money. They're not making it off the gas. And also then if there's a chain of gas stations, they have a little bit more flexibility in, in you know, how they're pricing their gasoline. Does this make life harder for a small gas station owner, somebody who doesn't have the margins for risk? Are you concerned about that at all? So actually the, the study that the petroleum marketers paid for found that in states with minimum markup laws, um, you actually didn't see any negative impact on the smallest 
of gas station retailers. And so it's actually some of the largest retailers in the country that are some of the biggest proponents of keeping minimum markup laws on the books. And again, when we look at states that have this or states that don't, we don't see a difference in the number of small retailers. Uh, we don't see a difference in the number of gas stations. Over time, uh, you see more and more of the profits from gas retailers coming from their convenience store items, coming from uh, soda, coming from breakfast sandwiches they're selling, and less from the actual gas. And that's a trend that has taken place with or without these laws on the books. Uh, finally, before we go, the House version of the bill was moved to the General Register. As you said, um, the Senate bill was laid over for possible inclusion. There is bipartisan support. So if this bill does become law, when will Minnesotans see lower prices for gasoline? My, my hope is that we'd start seeing lower gas prices this summer, and especially that's oftentimes when we see the price of gas uh, go up when there's more demand, when people are traveling for summer vacations. And I think it's going to be really important with the inflation that uh, Minnesotans are feeling across the economy to help them uh, save some money on their gas bill. And so I'm looking forward to getting this bill done this session. Senator Jordan Rasmussen, welcome to the Senate. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Prior to the passage in the House, lawmakers advocated for a bill that would protect out-of-state women who traveled to Minnesota for abortion care. This bill ensures that Minnesotans can do what is legal and exercise their rights in Minnesota without the threat of prosecution from other states. A prominent example of a law that we're working to protect Minnesotans from is Texas's SB 8 law that deputizes individuals to enforce the state's, their state's six-week abortion ban, allowing anyone in the state of Texas to sue anyone who helps another person obtain an abortion, even if it's just by counseling them or providing a ride to a clinic. These increasingly radical, restrictive laws are designed to ban abortion outright. They are not based on science, they are not based in health care, and they are disrupting the legal landscape regarding rights related to health care. As Minnesotans, we cannot stand idly by. There is a chilling effect on providers about the type of health care they can provide and whether they will be prosecuted for giving patients the reproductive health care that they need. Doctors, nurses, and other health care providers have told us how they witnessed the fear and confusion introduced by these laws among their patients and their colleagues here in Minnesota, not to mention their colleagues in hostile states. So today, we look forward to passing the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act uh, today off the House floor to protect people's rights to bodily autonomy. The overturning of Roe versus Wade has plunged our country into an unprecedented legal landscape with a patchwork of laws that vary from state to state. Unfortunately, in many states across the country, legislatures are passing laws to not only restrict access to reproductive health care, but to outright criminalize it. It cannot be overstated how serious the situation is for millions of Americans. Every state neighboring Minnesota has moved to further restrict access to reproductive health care, including abortion care. And some states are even seeking the death penalty for those essential health care needs. Thanks to the voters of Minnesota, that's not going to happen here. Instead of restricting access to essential health care, we will expand it and protect it and make sure that patients and doctors who are in Minnesota are kept safe. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.